The America's Democrats podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to americasdemocrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. This week, civil rights leader Ben Jealous on why cities and states have to take the lead in reimagining public safety. Scholar Cheryl Cashin on why it's critical to confront government's role in creating racial inequity if we want to undo it. Plus, Bill Press with journalist Ron Brownstein on the year a cultural shift in L.A. turned into a sea change for politics across the nation. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus, and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Ben Jealous welcomes efforts at the federal level to rein in abusive policing, but says they won't go far enough unless they're matched by transformative reform at the local level. And we say hello to Ben Jealous, president of People for the American Way and former president of the NAACP. Ben Jealous, thank you so much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you. It's good to be here. And our pleasure to have you with us. You know, shortly after the verdict was announced, finding Derek Chauvin guilty on three counts in the killing of George Floyd, you wrote in an op-ed about a sense of incomplete relief. Why incomplete? And we, um, we got accountability that day, but we still haven't achieved justice. We've got to make sure that George Floyd's daughter can grow up assured that she's safer than her father was. We've seen from the police killings one after the other after the other, innocent civilians being killed by the police, unarmed, unarmed civilians being killed by the police again and again, even on the day that the verdict came down. We have a long way to go in this country. Mm-hmm. You and many other leaders from the civil rights community have drawn our attention to the need to rethink public safety. One of the ideas you emphasize is the need to challenge the practice of authoritarian policing. How does this misuse of authority by police interfere with genuine public safety? Well, I mean, so many ways. The first is that authoritarian policing, authoritarian officers being recruited to police endangers all of us. We forget that in between Philando Castile and George Floyd in Minneapolis, a white woman was killed by a black officer because she, why was she killed? Because she was not not responsive to his questions and she moved sporadically. Why was she not responsive and moved sporadically? Because she was having an epileptic seizure. Did he open the door to help her out medically? No, he shot her through the windshield. He shot her through the windshield. She was having an epileptic seizure, but she moved in a quick and suspicious way and she did not you know, obey his commands. You don't obey, you get killed. Mm -hmm. Sure, Black folks, we are disproportionately the ones who get killed. We're the canaries in the coal mine. Ultimately, what gets the canary can kill everybody. And, And we've seen that in Minneapolis. We've seen it in many other places. Turns out that if you wanna change that situation, you have to change who you recruit. The city of Ithaca, New York, years ago, even between the most, even before the most recent reforms, years ago said, in addition to testing basic psychological fitness, physical fitness, you know, do you, have you been certified? Have you gone through the the course of the academy? We're also gonna test how authoritarian you are. If you're too authoritarian, we're not gonna hire you. Why they do that? Because of a researcher named Phil Goff, who used to be at UCLA, now he's at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in the SUNY system, did a bunch of research and found that the officers who rate high on implicit bias, but low on authoritarianism 
very unlikely to kill you. They're racist, but they're chill. They're unlikely to kill you. The guy's kind of uptight. The guy ranks high in authoritarianism, but he has like a rainbow of friends, maybe even a rainbow of ex-girlfriends. He'll kill you very quickly. And so for seven years, they've done this authoritarian test up in Ithaca and their officers. This is where Cornell University is. 75% of the officers who pass every other type of fitness, the, the usual battery of fitness exams for police officers in America, 75% of them fail the authoritarianism test. Why is that? Well, anecdotally, you talk to school teachers as I have in community after community who are at the funeral for one of their former students who's been killed, you know, unarmed and killed by the police. White teachers, black teachers will tell you the same thing. When they go down to the station house, they don't see a whole lot of bullies. They see a whole lot of kids who are bullied. You know, those kids have guns and they're in charge. And you better do what they'll say, you know, do what they say or, or they might just kill you. Mm -hmm. you um, you've also written and spoken about the need to build a public safety system that represents who we are today and not one that takes us back to the worst eras in our history. And it's hard not to imagine that we haven't taken several steps backwards, especially recently. How does this history influence the way policing has played out in recent years? You know, on my dad's side, I descend from seven officers or six officers and one drummer boy in the Massachusetts Regiment of the Revolutionary Army of the Continental Army. Um, my mom's side, I uh, descend from Thomas Jefferson's grandmother. When you look at policing, our policing descends either from the old red coats, from the British colonial forces or some areas, Vermont, New Orleans, maybe the French colonial forces, or from slave patrols. Like those that would capture my ancestors trying to uh, uh, escape from Jefferson's grandmother's plantation because her grandchildren were also her slaves. And the culture gets handed down no matter what the course is at the academy. The culture eats policy for lunch every day. You ever seen Denzel Mo Washington's movie Training Day, you have an insight into you know, certainly how the worst officers are trained, but what's common is, you know, for example, on when to use force, when to escalate it, how to de-escalate it so you don't have the, the situation, the de-escalate the situation so you don't have to use force. When is that training done in England where 90% of officers don't carry a gun? It's done every six months. It's done at the station house or they're brought to a training center. And in America, when is it done? It's done on one day. Now, every single jurisdiction in America is allowed to have their own use of force training standards and their own use of force standards. In England, it's one for the entire country, as it is in every other Western democracy. But in America, it's super federalized, balkanized, and idiosyncratic. And the most common standard for American police departments is you are trained one day at the academy, eight hours, nine to five. That's it. Never updated never refreshed. That's how you end up with an officer who can mistake their, their gun for a taser because they're not put through that stress testing, that training again, again, and again, and again. In England where they don't carry guns, they do it every six months here in America, one day at the academy. And then as the Denzel Washington movie reminds us, it's training day. And so you're actually not trained at the academy. You're trained by fellow officers who hand down tradition. And the tradition when it comes to policing black communities is one of completely unnecessary violence that tears the fabric of trust between the community and the police, makes us all more danger, endangered in the process, but it also creates this memory muscle in officers that, you know, I mean, I don't know how, how you feel, Jim, but as a black guy with a white dad and white uncles and white cousins, like when I hear them say, well, in Minnesota, if black men are four times more likely to be killed by the police than white men, it does occur to me that they're killing a hell of a lot of white men. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> There's a lot more white guys than black guys in Minnesota. Right. So, so I, I, you know, I, discrepancy I, does not mean that white men are safe. Yeah, I, I hadn't I hadn't thought about that. But, yeah, when you look at the numbers, that would certainly suggest that. <laughs> um, 
We're speaking to Ben Jealous, president of People for the American Way and former president of the NAACP. And I'm, I'm thinking about what you just talked about with the training and, and what goes on in, 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 uh, in England, for instance, and in other European countries. You're not going to mistake a cell phone for a gun. You're not going to mistake an epileptic fit for something else. Um, and it's just amazing to me that it's one and done as far as that type of training goes. And that's that's seriously something wrong with the system. Um, you've also pointed out that meaningful reform of policing in America won't just come from federal action, such as the George Floyd and Policing Act. What are both the possibilities and limits of this bill? Possibilities for this bill is that it does improve how officers are trained. It does improve um, overall you know, policy governing policing in America. The limits are it doesn't go far enough. It doesn't transform us to a system where you have one standard for use of force. You have one standard for use of force training. Um, ultimately, policing in America will have to be reformed from the bottom up. President Obama is correct on that. President Obama and I first crossed paths when he was a state senator trying to end the practice of torturing defendants in Chicago to get con confessions out of them. And uh, I was working for Amnesty International USA. And of course, we're, we're an anti-torture organization. And what he understood then, and we understood, is that to end torture in, in American policing, you actually have to end it department by department by department. Um, the uh, And so it is with abuse of policing of all sorts. Uh, again, every department in America is allowed to have their own force of use of force standard, their own use of force training standard. Um, and so what's the good news in that? Well, the good news in that is twofold. One, it means that you, whoever you are, wherever you are, can do a lot to make your community safer because if you can just get consensus as they did in Ithaca, New York recently amongst your city council, to transform policing, say to a civilian led public safety department um, where they employ both social workers to deal say with homeless and you know, other groups that really need social, frontline social workers you know, and then police officers to deal with this, the most serious safety issues. You can transform your entire world. You have to wait for Congress, to wait for the federal government. Mitch McConnell doesn't get a vote on your local police department. So that's, that's good news. The other good news is that while America has well over 10,000 counties, I forget how many, 12,000, 15,000, but well over 10,000 counties, there's only about five or 600 where 80% of, of black people live. And so we change policing. If, if, this, if the movement's about black lives matter, if you will, if, if changing the policing of black folks will ultimately make us all safer, then we only have to change um, about 5% of the, the counties or less in the country. And we will have protected more than 80% of the black lives. We would have, frankly, protected more than 60% more than of American lives in general. Americans are increasingly concentrated into cities and near suburbs. So uh, the good news is that, you know, um, you can do a lot in your local community. And the other good news is that it can add up very quickly for, for the nation as a whole. You know, and you pointed out, Ben, in that op-ed in The Hill, that change at the local level is a huge job. Over 12,000 uh, police departments in the U.S. How do we begin? You know, Where we do start, we start? We start, yeah. we start in your local community. Again, whoever you are, wherever you are, you have a lot of power. Ithaca, New York, third day of the Derek Chauvin trial, voted to replace their police department with a civilian-led public safety department gave that department the power to replace through attrition, not firing anybody, but as a college town, this is where Cornell University is, they do a lot of training of officers. Officers pass through there in their career on the way to Rochester or New York City, for example. So they have a lot of attrition. And they, through attrition, they'll replace up to half the officers with uniformed unarmed social workers. I'm not saying that that's the, the one size fits all model for every jurisdiction in America. What I am saying is that what they did, any community can do, which is the push pause and the inertia from the British colonial army or the inertia from slave patrols and say in this 21st century America about to be 250 years old, multiracial democracy, what do we need right now to keep us all safe? And then design that. That's the power of what Ithaca did. That's what we can do in every community. That's what, what we must do. Is it more important at the local level than at the federal level 
for meaningful change? Yes. Where, yes. Where does, and the bottom line is yes, to... yes, 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 yes. The nice thing about federal change is that we can all do it together. We can get it done. We can move things forward. What is not happening at the federal level is a wholesale nationalization of our policing, like making us like England or France. If we, you know, if that was on the table, wow, that could transform things. We would have one set of rules. We could, you know, govern them as a nation. Um, that's likely where we need to get to. But assuming that that's not happening and that the federal government is essentially just sort of um, changing the contours, you know, nibbling around the edges. Um, look, the wholesale change that America needs is, is, is going to come from local changes to local departments because every department is ultimately local. OK, Ben Jealous, president of People for the American Way, former president of the NAACP, joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Ben, appreciate your time and love to have you back again soon. Anytime, brother. Always good Thank- to be with you, Jim. Thank you. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen to this America's Democrats dot org podcast, a project of 21st century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This social security measure. I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security, and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing, or one time, in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America. Whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job, that's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. Coming up next, a blueprint for racial healing in the Biden era. But first, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist for his common sense commentary. Not only are the rich different from you and me, they're getting more different than ever. I'm not referring to mere millionaires, but to the billionaire bunch. In the past year, while ordinary Americans have lost jobs, businesses, and homes due to the pandemic economic crash, America's 664 billionaires have found themselves nearly 40% richer than before COVID. These fortunate few collectively added more than a trillion dollars in 2020 to their personal stashes of wealth. And practically all of them got so much richer by doing nothing. Their money made the extra money for them because corporate stock prices zoomed even as regular people lost income. Take a peek at the richest of these different ones, Jeff Bezos, the alpha geek of Amazon. He hauled in an additional $75 billion last year, roughly $37 million an hour. You could do a lot of good with such riches or you could splurge on yourself. Jeff splurged. He bought one of the largest sailing vessels ever built. More than one and a third football fields long, the super yacht cost the diminutive mega billionaire some half billion bucks. Plus, he'll pay some 60 million each year for operating expenses. Also, he had to buy a support yacht to sail along with his main boat. Why? Because the three sails on his 400-footer are so huge that a helicopter can't land on the deck, requiring an auxiliary yacht to provide a helipad. See, the rich really are different. Where to park our helicopter while at sea is a problem you and I don't have to face. This is Jim Hightower saying, according to mega yacht sellers, the main draw of these ostentatious purchases is that they reinforce inequality 
literally letting the rich float in leisure and luxury oceans apart from even having to see hoi polloi like us. The Hightower Radio Lowdown is brought to you by our new Lowdown Happy Hour, now live streaming on Facebook from the Chat and Chew Cafe. With kick-ass political spark plugs like Beto O'Rourke, musical champions like Marsha Ball, and grassroots change makers like the New Georgia Project and People's Action, the Lowdown Happy Hour is reaching out to you to help put the move in movement. So grab a libation and join the fun. Details at HightowerLowdown.org. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Scholar Cheryl Cashin's latest book explores the history of government's role in expanding segregation in housing. She says that a shared understanding of this racist past is key to uniting the nation on a racial justice agenda going forward. And we say hello to Cheryl Cashin, a law professor at Georgetown University and author of the forthcoming White Space Black Hood, a book about the role of residential segregation in producing racial inequality. Cheryl Cashin, welcome back to the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you for having me, Jim. Always, Well, always a pleasure to, uh, to have you with us. Now, you recently wrote for Politico an article titled A Blueprint for Racial Healing in the Biden Era. It addresses how the Biden administration could make meaningful advancement toward a racial reckoning that much of the country is calling for. To start off, what does racial reckoning mean to you? Well, it's honestly looking at the truth of our past and our present in terms of the systems that work against people of color and frankly, particularly black people. Um, we, we have a second, uh, not just slavery and Jim Crow, which people know about, but um, in the 20th century, over seven decades, the federal government invested in segregation, encouraged exclusion, uh, encouraged, um, intentionally cut Black Americans out of the largest wealth building programs, you know, the, the American dream of home ownership, um, lots of the New Deal uh, programs. And, you know, a lot of people are, are becoming aware of that legacy, but just reckoning honestly with the truth of it for seven decades, uh, this government, the federal government, had intentionally pro-white and anti-black policies. And reckoning with that is, is, is recognizing the truth of it and the truth that today we still have systems that intentionally encourage segregation, that overinvest, particularly in affluent white space, that disinvest in communities of color, particularly black neighborhoods. And, you know, I think a lot of people, um, if you don't have that reckoning, they, they, they may have this view that um, they got everything they have on their own and that people in struggling communities only have themselves to blame. Mm -hmm. Now, the blueprint speaks very directly to the need to build consensus for new anti-racist policies. And you write that, quote, it is critical to understand the racial inequality the American government intentionally created, close quote. Why is understanding the past so important to building a future? Well, you, you, you can't address racial inequalities. You can't build a political consensus for addressing racial inequality uh, if people don't know what the source of it is, right? Um, one thing we're learning, I, I see this in local movements. Um, when people are given the information about the fact that the federal, state, and local government intentionally orchestrated affluent white havens and created elsewhere, you know, the iconic black ghetto that they, uh, uh, you know, encouraged and demanded that people use racially restrictive covenants, that they intentionally um, um, segregated public housing, that they intentionally built interstate highways to create a wall between the black and white side of town, um, that they intentionally redlined black neighborhoods and disinvested in them. 
um, that actually builds a coalition on the ground. Like, oh, I didn't realize this. I, I, okay, I'm willing to support then policies that redress that. And 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 so if you don't give that history, what a lot of people who who aren't aware of it do, they tend to fall back on stereotypes, you know, and and you know, struggling high poverty neighborhoods, they fall back on the stereotype, the welfare queen, the thug, you know, the, the super predator that some politicians have actively engaged in. They tend to think that people are down and out and struggling because of their own individual behavior, right? So mm -hmm. you have to educate people. And I think uh, most Americans are fair. Most Americans believe that discrimination is wrong. There are, you know, there's a, a growing swath of, of white Americans that values black lives, that say black lives matter, that want to, to be part of an America that values everyone and invests in everyone. So, um, you know, most people believe that America should not be uh, based on favoring one group over others, discriminating against others. So educating people about that le legacy helps to create a broad multiracial consensus for fairer and saner policies. And by the way, you know, the only people who really benefit from this legacy are very affluent people who can buy their way into communities that, that are bulwarked from poverty, you know, bulwark, you know, that, that middle-class people also don't get it, get, aren't able to get into. So that's why racial reckoning and, 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 and understanding the past is necessary. It helps to create a new politics for fairness and equity. Let me throw a bit of a wrench into it. In terms of getting that message across, many Americans don't want to hear it. They, they'd rather attribute racial inequality to personal behavior and not systemic discrimination. It seems a level of ignorance to me. What can Biden do to bridge this divide? Well, he's already doing it. First off, it's no small thing that Biden won with 81 million votes, the most, the first president in U.S. history to exceed 80 million votes, right? In a campaign that centered racial equity, he talked about it on the campaign trail. He didn't run away from it, right? Um, he said forthrightly that, you know, he wanted to close the racial wealth gap. He talked about it and, and he won decisively, right? Um, you know, in his inaugural address, he spoke forthrightly about white supremacy, the first president in inaugural address in the history of this country to do so. And he's got like stratospheric approval ratings, particularly among Democrats. He has not been penalized. In fact, I think a lot of people are drawn to him because he's honest and, and he just tells the truth and he does it forthrightly. He, he's, you know, uh, uniting people uh, with a message of fairness that's authentic. And he's not just talking about racial equity, but he's talking about fairness for working people. Uh, um, you know, who knew that Joe Biden, the moderate, you know, that we, we, we know for many years, I didn't see this coming. But uh, yes, there are Americans who don't want to hear it. There are. But uh, most, if you look at polls, I mean, this, this is a Democrats podcast, right? You know, yes. You know, yes your, your audience is Democrats, right? Correct. Uh, uh, and independents maybe, but in opinion polls, Democrats overwhelmingly acknowledge that racial minorities, particularly black people face systemic disadvantages, right? Republicans acknowledge that there's inequality, but what they tend to do is blame individuals' personal failings for racial inequality. So your audience that's listening to this is open to this very message. Um, you know, I love Democrats. I've never voted for anybody but a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a good show for you to be on as well. 
Well, and, and you also point out it's not just white Americans that must be won over to a racial justice agenda. It's black mm-hmm. Americans, too. You argue that their votes and enthusiasm must be earned, especially the votes of young black Americans. How does the Biden administration best make this case? You know, a lot of people said Biden's too old. Biden can't connect with younger folks. Here's a test. Well, um, you know, I, I have not, in all honesty, looked carefully at the numbers. But uh, we got over, we won, I said 81 million votes. And, and, you know, if you look at the Senate runoff elections in Georgia, right, they did reach younger black voters. Uh, they did raise the turnout over what the general had been, right? Right. And I do think that Biden and the Democratic Party, uh, particularly with his, his most recent proposals, his infrastructure plan, which, which has some serious racial equity components in it, um, I think he is beginning to speak to people, even young people. You know, it mat- what, what, what a young Black person needs to hear to get, have enthusiasm about going to the polls is that they're individual life will be better, right? They'll be less likely to get shot or harassed by the police if they vote for who, whatever Democrat is running, right? And I think when you have a Justice Department that is returned to, you know, um, um, auditing police departments and, and, and sending the signal that, you know, we, we, we are going to transform policing, that matters, you know, and when people, um, uh, have hope about getting a job or, you know, getting um, new infrastructure or, or a bus route. You know, the Biden administration is beginning to put very specific concrete things out there. So, um, you know, my, I, I teach young, youngish, young, they're young to me, students, law students. And most of my law students were Bernie Sanders supporters, right? And a lot of them said what they were most interested in was 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 student debt relief. But I, I I'm hearing an openness to Biden, you know, that I hadn't heard before among them, because like so many other progressives in the party, you know, he he's he's more progressive than Obama was, you know. We- you know, it's interesting is that his, you know, the the most moderate uh, of the Democrats in the 2020 uh, uh, campaign for, for president and all this kind of thing that you heard. Clearly, the man listens. The man recognizes history and, and how you sometimes need to change maybe your beliefs and the way you view things. And you listen to other people and you find out what people want, what they need. And that's how you that's how you be a president. Well, I, I also want to say this. I think it's not just listening. Joe Biden knows that black people saved his campaign, right? What's interesting is Joe Biden's interest in getting elected converged greatly with black aspirations, right? You know, if it weren't for Jim Clyburn and South Carolina and black people giving him a chance, right? And so it's he's he and the people who are around him are counting the votes, right? And when you look at those Georgia Senate races, for example, right, the interests of the Democratic Party and the aspirations of Black people have converged because if you don't get people excited into the polls in those states, you don't win. And it's because of Stacey Abrams and Black voters and their mobilization that we have a bare governing majority. So this is the most fascinating period for me. It's not just, you know, um, trying to do right morally, right? I, I think Joe Biden sees this, this is necessary to building a strong, governing, multiracial Democratic Party that wins over and over again, right? That he has to speak to. But I also think, you know, it's very interesting to watch. I do think he is he has evolved, he's caring, he's learned a lot, you know? And I think his age also has something to do with it. You know, he's emancipated, right? You know, he and I, I don't know if he plans to run again, but I th- I really believe this man wants to do what he thinks could be transformative, you know, uh, on the racial front. You know, when he talked, he said Charlottesville is what made him run. That's what he said. And right. I, I kind of believe him, you know? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, yeah, you, you you can't say he's he's a dishonest person. I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> which is which is nice to say after four years. Um, <laughs> we're speaking to Cheryl Cash and law professor at Georgetown University, author of the forthcoming White Space Black Hood, a book about the role of residential segregation in producing racial inequality. And Cheryl, to, to put this in the context of policy, let's talk about the subject of your new book, which I should point out comes out in September. And it, it explores the origins and impact of racial segregation in our country. Going back to where we started, what do Americans need to understand about the government's role in segregation if they're to be won over to the idea that government should fix it? Okay, so at the dawn of the 20th century, in major cities, you could find black people living in close proximity to white people, poor people living in close proximity to rich people. The natural state of, of, of things was mixing class and race. Everybody was close to each other, right? And the what ha- happened was when uh, about six and a half million people, black people left the South to escape virulent Jim Crow over the decades and went North and West. The main response to them is in, to black people in large numbers was to segregate them. And the federal government was the main actor. Beginning in the thirties, um, when they created for the first time, the 30 year mortgage, it didn't exist before, right? And they said, okay, uh, banks, we will uh, insure 30 year mortgages, but only if you include racially restrictive covenants and only if you uh, do it in, uh, if you lend in white spaces. They explicitly marked black neighborhoods, you know, which weren't extremely segregated, but they marked them as hazardous and said, they, we, we won't subsidize them, right? And they encouraged racially restrictive covenants. Then the U.S. Supreme Court incur, uh, sanctioned what's called exclusionary zoning, zoning that says in this neighborhood we'll only have single-family housing, no multifamily, no apartments, you know. And then the government piled on. The federal government created um, the public housing program and intentionally, you know, well they acquiesced in local government saying, okay, we'll take your money to build public housing, um, and we're going to have white public housing here and black public housing there, right? But what happens when you build a high rise public housing uh, project and 100% of the people there are black and poor? Overnight you create a ghetto, right? So the iconic high poverty black ghetto did not exist. It is a government creation, right? Um, And you know, I could go on and on. The Interstate Highway Program, the largest public works program in the history of the world when it was first funded. Um, all, in every major city, there's a story about where the highways was laid. And invariably, um, the highways were used to mow down Uh, mow through black neighborhoods, often the most vital black economic corridor, um, and, you know, to create like a firewall between whiteness and blackness. All of these policies are cumulative, right? Um, And so, you know, at one point, we had nearly 50 cities in the U.S. that were hyper segregated, right? And what happened? White people fled, right? White people took advantage of the American dream, the low interest government backed loan, they fled to the suburbs where they could use exclusionary zoning. So this this landscape that we have of of abundance and concentrated need was totally engineered by government, right? It's a, um, let's see, uh, Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law goes through it, right? And thank you for mentioning my new book. I, I go through it a lot, but what I emphasize is that's the, that's the 20th century but we still do this today. The federal government still invests in segregation. So do local governments, right? Um, and we way, way over invest in uh, infrastructure, in um, private amenities, uh, in schooling, in affluent white neighborhoods, and we disinvest elsewhere, right? Segregation creates a politics where communities of abundance 
and communities of need are in direct horizontal competition for limited resources. And affluent white spaces, they get more than their fair share, often subsidized by everyone else of roads, bridges, large infrastructure projects, you know. Um, and what's, what's invisible to people is the only people who benefit are the people who can afford the gold standard neighborhoods. Everybody in this country, particularly the working and middle class, suffers in a system that's premised on segregation and containment of black people. So I shine a light on all this and, and maybe you'll have me back in September when it comes out. I mean, it, well, what's fascinating is, is, you know, we talked earlier about <clears throat> um, most Americans are, you know, aren't, aren't necessarily racist and that kind of thing, but they're ignorant to a lot of this history. They're, they, they don't understand a lot of the stuff that you're talking about and they, they, they've never been taught that. They've right. never been taught about how the highway system was actually a systemic way of creating a separation between black and white. So right. they just, they don't know it. Right. And that's why, you know, I, I write about it, but also see whenever people talk about race, well, you know, in, in a, in a almost childish way, frankly, and I, the right does this a lot. They want to suggest that people like me are just calling white people racist. Absolutely not. Right. Individuals with their with their individual pre prejudices um, could not have created this system. You know, individuals actually are forced to make really difficult decisions about where to live, especially if you have children. Right? There's more actual demand for stable, integrated neighborhoods than there are neighborhoods to fill that demand. Right? I'm not saying that. Um, there's not racial prejudice out there. You know, we had this, <laughs> the, the whole reaction to the Tim Scott um, response to the uh, uh, state of the right. union, you know. Yeah. Um, what I think, actually, you know, and, and you know, what I said in this piece, and thank you for mentioning it, I'm a, a contributing editor to Politico. Um, you know, what, what's, what's giving me optimism for t about the Democratic Party is, we have a coalition of whites that are willing to see and name racism, willing to fight it in themselves, willing to fight it systemically, or at least open to being, but want to be part of a multiracial coalition for fair and equitable policies, right? Um, um, and you know what? What I say, and it's it's very different than calling people racist. I say that there's a lot of racial resentment on the right. That you know, cynically, um, a lot of politicians, particularly Trump, stoke that resentment. But I take pains to say racial resentment is not the same as racism. Mm -hmm. right? You know, there are too many politicians and and uh, media people. And, and talk jocks who, who, who try to stoke resentment for rating in votes, right? What I, now, the, the term I, yeah, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Go, no, you, 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 it's your floor. The term I like to use is, is, is dexterous and non-dexterous, right? Um, a culturally dexterous person is, is willing to accept that they or their group is one among many. Right, they're, they're in, in a culturally dexterous white person it, it accepts the loss of centrality of whiteness, right? It accepts, okay, we're just becoming more diverse. I don't have to get my way all the time, right? Whether, whether it's in the Democratic Party or at the school board meeting or at the PTA, right? I'm willing to be part of the discussion you know, it doesn't have to be my way culturally. You know, I'm willing to engage in it. And, and, and you know, and I know sometimes it's hard, right? Right. The non-dexterous person sees the changing demographics as a threat, right? Um, uh, and, and, and wants to insist that, and, that their social norms be the dominant ones. And you see, you know, sometimes the dog whistles are explicit, you know, when you have something like, well, English only, or, you know, that or people who are just scared 
for schools to teach Chicano studies to Chicano kids to help them see themselves. And somehow that's anti-white. You know what I'm saying, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's the fulcrum. You know, Obama actually got a lot of working class white voters um, right. the first time he ran, right? So I, 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 um, I, I'm optimistic. I think the swath of, of uh, culturally dexterous white people is growing. And um, I think it's, you know, Joe Biden got to 51%, which is no small thing in American politics. I think with each passing decade, um, with more engagement, people of color taking their rightful place, running for office, keeping people enthusiastic and, and open-minded whites, I think it's gonna get easier and easier for the Democratic Party, you know, to get to 52, 53%, you know, and then we gotta tackle gerrymandering. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's another topic for another show. Uh, real quickly, before before you go, I want to point out, you know, despite the many challenges described in your piece, it can be read as an optimistic piece because you suggest that Americans of all political stripes could be brought into the effort of racial healing if they are spoken to with honesty and transparency. So do you feel optimistic? I do. I just expressed that. to Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, whew, it was close, right? January 6th was depressing, right? You know, um, we, all, we, we, we were in a very dark place and we could be again, right? But I, I, I believe that um, most Americans are good, um, that the, the silver lining and the terrible uh, execution of George Floyd, you know, we had a summer where we had the largest uh, human rights demonstrations we'd ever had. Something like 15 to 26 million people, over 2,500 cities. I, I, you know, where people are holding up signs and I still have them in my neighborhood. I go walking in my neighborhood and, and my white neighbors are telling me that my life and my kids' life matters. And that, you know, the sign itself is not enough, but I see a hunger in this country for reckoning, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think we have the right man in the White House to help us right now. So I'm, I'm optimistic, um, but optimism is a choice, right? right? Yeah. You know, the forces of darkness want you to stay in the bed and be depressed and not get up and work for and fight for the country you want, you know, and this country's worth fighting for. Amen to that. Cheryl Cashin, law professor at Georgetown University and, again, author of the forthcoming White Space Black Hood due out in September. Uh, check it out. It's very worth the read. And, and check out the Politico article as well. Cheryl, we appreciate your time with us, as always. We'd love to do it again soon. Thank you. I'd love to come back. Fantastic. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. <laughs> We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to keep the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. And now Bill Press with journalist and author Ron Brownstein on the long reach of 1970s pop culture on the politics of today. Uh, 1974, you paint the picture, you call it the magic hour in Los Angeles, really the golden age of film, mm -hmm. television, music and politics, as I read and enjoyed the book. How did it happen? Why in Los Angeles, of all places? Yeah, really, really good questions. Um, so um, uh, I think w w what we're looking at in the early 1970s in pop culture is that this is the moment when the social changes put forward by the 60s, when the critique of American mm -hmm. life that emerged from the social movements of the 1960s was cemented into pop culture. 
and therefore, and from there into the way that we lived. You know, all if came you go together, back, right? All together, all together at the same time, all driven by the same force, which was uh, the need for these industries to respond to the growing power of the massive baby boom generation, uh, which influenced, which changed culture before it changed politics, um, uh, and in fact, arguably even over the long run, changed culture more than it ever changed politics, because the baby boom was not as monolithically liberal as it was assumed to be. Uh, you know, it, it's a little known fact that 1972 was the first year of exit polls and Richard Nixon actually won most white people under 30 in 1972. Oh. But, but, the, but the liberal side of the baby boom that fueled all of the big social movements of the 1960s put a lot of new ideas into the bloodstream. I mean, greater suspicion of authority in business and government, more autonomy for women, changing relations between men and women, new attitudes about family and marriage and sex, more kind of assertive uh, 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 pursuit of rights and inclusion uh, among from African-Americans and uh, gays and other groups, H Hispanics, other groups that had been marginalized. Um, there were a lot of ways in which the kind of the received wisdom of America in, you know, 1961 and 1962 uh, was challenged in, in, uh, by, by these movements, some of which you, you know, uh, were, were, were very, very aware of the environmental movement, right? Um, right. And uh, through the 60s, as I, as I show in the book, um, TV and, mu and movies in particular tried their best to ignore all of this, right? Walter Cronkite, as I write, spent half an hour every night documenting all of the fissures opening in American life. And then the networks would spend the next three and a half hours trying to erase all of that from people's <laughs> minds. Right. I mean, you had the Beverly Hillbillies, you had Petticoat Junction, Green Acres, the Andy Griffith show, Gunsmoke, all of these kind of tributes to the simple wisdom of rural life. We didn't get any closer to uh, Vietnam than Gomer Pyle and McHale's Navy, Hogan's Heroes. Um, and then of course the movies um, were largely the same. I mean, there were some very good movies made, but it was The Sound of Music and Mary Poppins and The Longest Day and The Great Escape and, uh, you know, Ben, uh, 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 Lawrence of Arabia, um, mm -hmm. it, 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 Dr. Zhivago. I mean, it, it, they, they did not grapple with what was happening around them. Now, music was forced to respond sooner because a bigger share of their audience was composed of the young people who were in the middle of all of these changes. But the story I tell is how uh, in Hollywood, starting in 67 with Bonnie and Clyde and The Graduate, but really accelerating after Easy Rider in 69, and, and I argue culminating in 1974, and the same thing in television, really beginning in fall of 1970 when Mary Tyler Moore goes on the air, but the absolute turning point being in January 1971 when CBS puts on All in the Family, something unlike anything that had ever appeared on right. television before. What you saw is that uh, both movies and um, TV joining music in kind of embracing this new set of values and experiences and being the bridge between ideas that have been insurrectionary when first advanced in the 60s and a mass American audience uh, in the early 1970s, a process that I think culminated in 1974. Well, I have to tell you, you know, uh, having lived in L.A. and having lived through this, I got to L.A. just a couple of years after this, um, and and hanging out at the Troubadour and hanging out at mm. Dantana's <laughs> and knowing most of these people, I, I did not realize what a huge, significant period we were living through. Let's start. Yeah. You mentioned television. But as you say, uh, the, you, you mentioned Archie Bunker, Mary Tyler Moore, Carol Burnett, you know, mm. go down the list. Um, and MASH, uh, this was the Saturday night, right, was the greatest right. night probably ever in the history of television. Yeah. It was called that. The, the Saturday night, the, there was the one year, fall 73 through spring 74 on CBS, was the one year that All in the Family, Mary Tyler Moore, MASH, as well as Bob Newhart and Carol Burnett were all together on the same night. Oh, and, God. And, uh, and has been called the greatest night in, in television history. And that year, 1974, is also the same year that Jackson Brown, Linda Ronstadt, The Eagles, and Joni Mitchell all put out career redefining albums. It's also the same year of arguably, I, I'm trying to remember another, I mean, you'd have to go back to the 40s to have two films of the magnitude of Chinatown and Godfather Part Two dueling for the Oscar in the same year, as well as other movies like The Conversation and the filming of 
of Shampoo, Nashville, and Jaws. And Nashville and Jaws, I, I think, are really important to understand in, in kind, mm-hmm. of, kind of bookends. I'll come back to that. But, you know, what's interesting, Bill, is like in talking to people, you know, I interviewed over 100 people. I, many of the, many of, the, of the folks who created all of this art, whether it's uh, Warren Beatty and uh, Norman Lear and Jane Fonda and Linda Ronstadt and Jackson Brown and Graham Nash and everything, a lot of people talked to me. And there was an understanding vertically within each of these silos that something big was going on. You know, I mean, Rob Reiner yeah. talked about watching MASH and Mary Tyler Moore and being really proud to be part. And James L. Brooks, who was the creator of Mary Tyler Moore, you know, talked about watching All in the Family. And Irving Azoff, who was the manager of the Eagles, talked to me about, uh, you know, just as he said, there was something magical, you know, from Hollywood to Malibu. And obviously, and Warren Beatty and Robert Town. Um, uh, Town wrote both Chinatown and Shampoo, Shampoo with Beatty. You know, talking about how they they recognize that they were giving more leeway than any generation of filmmakers before them in terms of what they could put on the screen, the stories they could tell, and how they could tell them. But I think what people didn't see was outside of their silo and and kind mm-hmm. of kind of understanding how much of all of this was happening at once at the same time. And even politically with, with Jerry, Jerry Brown's election in 1974, bringing into the political arena, I would argue really for the first time, some of the same themes, uh, the same critiques of American life that were infusing all this popular culture. I mean, like Jerry Brown, you know, who you later work for wins the democratic gubernatorial nomination in June, 1974 on a program of political reform two weeks before Chinatown is released and is described correctly by one reviewer as Watergate with real water. You know, he was kind of, he was kind of surfing to, to torture the metaphor further. He was kind of surfing that same wave. Um, and um, all of this was happening together. I would argue it was all happening because these industries felt the need to make themselves relevant to the values and experiences of a new generation uh, that were becoming an increasing part of their consumer base. Uh, And thus, a window opened for the expression of ideas uh, and experiences. Because, you know, I mean, we're starting to tell the first, we're starting to see the first African-American lead characters on television, the Jeffersons and Good Times and Sanford and Son and Chico and the Man and Mary Tyler Moore herself, women. Uh, Alice doesn't live here anymore. The Scorsese movie. You start to see different experiences and values come to the screen, uh, obviously being expressed in music as well, um, uh, in large part because they had to make themselves relevant to that new generation of consumers and they felt that pressure before the politicians did. I mean, you know, the electorate in America is pretty much always and probably always will be older and whiter than the country overall. And so I think the, the impact of generational change is more takes longer to unfold through the political system than it does through the pop culture. And I think that was the case in the early 70s. And I think it's very much the case now. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, Nixon won two elections by mobilizing the voters least happy with the way the country was changing, precisely as those changes were consolidating their dominant position in popular culture and thus really changing the way we live forever. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think you could argue the same thing is happening now. Trump has shown there's a lot of people who can be mobilized by promising to stop the way the country is changing. Um, uh, But what you can't actually do is stop the change. I mean, the, the, the rising generations are going to set are going to impose their values on the way that we live. And uh, I just think that process is inexorable, as, is as inexorable now as it was in the 1970s. So what started with uh, particularly All in the Family, where they, where they were talking about such um, socially conscious mm-hmm. issues, right? Uh, mm-hmm. We're still experiencing that today, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're right. reaping well, all, the harvest, basically. Yes. Well, All in the Family, I think, is the absolute turning point in the history of television, because I think it established irrevocably the idea that the medium was a fit platform from which to comment on American society. And I, in some ways, my favorite chapter in the book, or maybe the most revealing chapter in the book, is I tell the story at great length of how All in the Family got on the air. Um, after ABC had rejected it twice. And right. it was put on the air 
by by the way, Michael Eisner was the projectionist at one of the showings uh, for <laughs> the um, for the ABC executives who turned it down. But you know, All in the Family um, was the product of two very unlikely revolutionaries. I mean, Norman Lear, for as influential as he became. Uh, there was very little of his work in the 50s and 60s that would have led you to predict this was the guy who was going to transform television. I mean, he was very much mainstream entertainment. I mean, he worked on the Martha Ray show. He worked for Lewis and Martin. Uh, he, uh, you know, him and Bud Yorkin, when they founded their company together, uh, they did Come Blow Your Horn and Divo- Divorce American Style. He wrote The Night They Raided Minsky's, um, The Andy Williams Show. You remember The Andy Williams Show? I mean, that was not exactly the Smothers Brothers. Um, but He had this story that resonated with him because, uh, you know, originally this started off as a British half hour, the the basic construct, bigoted father, uh, you know, liberal son-in-law. And Norman, you know, that reminded him of his story with his father, Herman. And so uh, the 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 show till death do us part came to you know um, uh, uh, came to his attention through a variety of sources. He went out, he optioned it, tried to get it made on ABC. They wouldn't do it. And it got to CBS and into the hands of someone who was an even more unlikely revolutionary than Norman, a guy named Robert Wood. Did you ever encounter Robert Wood in your- No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Norman, I know well, but not not Robert. Robert Wood, basically the same age as Norman, graduated from USC, football fan, rah, rah, booster, you know, would not be caught reading Sartre, you know, uh, (laughs) was was a sales guy, went up the ranks at KNX and then KNXT here in Los Angeles. Um, uh, love Nixon, love Reagan, hated student demonstrators, eventually kind of got promoted from L.A. to New York and ascended up the ranks at CBS. One of the first things he did after he became CBS president in 1969 was to cancel the Smothers Brothers, who were really the CBS's first attempt to Mm -hmm. uh, plant a flag in the changing America. But because of his urban background, Wood was convinced, mostly by the business staff, that CBS had to get younger and less rural, right? I mean, you know, right. as, someone, as someone wrote, how many farmers were watching CBS didn't matter <laughs> unless you were trying to sell tractors. <laughs> so he, of all people, after ABC said no twice, he gave um, all the family the green light. And, but it was a really arduous process even after he gave it the green light. And I think I, you know, I tell the story at some length in the book of of the, of the final stages of getting it on the air in January oh, yeah. 1971, it was touch and go until the very last minute. Right. But you know, and, and after it, it aired, after it aired, there was that first segment, as you point out, there was still a lot of people who were very nervous about it and not sure they'd done the right thing. Right. Yes, and well, yeah. before the first segment, they put on a disclaimer. Like there's like a disembodied voice reading, like, you may not like this, but we thought it was worth trying. <laughs> Rob Reiner said to me, he's like, well, wait a minute. Like, well, you know, we're like, you're going on the air and you're already, you know, kind of trying to warn people they may not like it. That doesn't seem, and you know, it went on the air immediately after Hee Haw, which was just perfect. Oh. I mean, kind of like, you know, it really was the turning of the page from one era to another. Boy, I'll say. Uh, and, and back to the music field for just a second. I mean, yes. it is striking to me. Again, I knew so many of them. But when you think about the fact this was a time when Jackson Brown, Linda Ronstadt, Don Henley, you mentioned Irving, 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 Irving uh, Azar, Graham Nash, David Crosby, Joni Mitchell, yeah. they were all at the Troubadour, right? They yeah, were working to, and, and they, and they were, yeah, and they were working together and playing together and writing songs together and singing each other's songs. Uh, what an incredible, um, you know, timing and collection of talent. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I think that if you add up everything, if you add up James L. Brooks, Larry Gelbart, and Norman Lear on the one hand, and Warren Beatty and Francis Ford Coppola and Jack Nicholson and Robert Town and Arthur Penn, uh, plus the four that you, you know, the five or six you just mentioned, Joni Mitchell, Jackson Brown, Linda Ronsack, Glenn Fry, Don Henley, uh, Nash and Crosby. You add all of that up, all of them in the same place at the same time, all producing on all cylinders. But that, that's what initially drew me to the book, by the way. I mean, just the, yeah. the incredible confluence of talent. I, I think that's comparable to anything that you would talk about as a 20th century kind of cultural uh, lodestar, yeah. you know, whether it's Paris and yeah. the literary world, uh, the modern art world in New York in the 50s. Um, and I know it's unusual, you know, people aren't used to hearing that about LA, 
But I think LA in the early 70s can go toe to toe with any other city at any point in the 20th century for a collection of, of cultural uh, talent. But what was really striking about the music side was what you alluded to. You know, I call it the Republic of Rock and Roll. It was a period in which there was incredible collaboration and support. Yeah, there was jealousy and, you know, people would kind of get, you know, their nose bent out of shape mm-hmm. when um, one one succeeded before the other. By and large, as Danny Korchmar, the guitar, guitarist who was also there at the time, said to me, you know, it wasn't like we thought there was only so much success to go around. We thought we were all going to succeed and everybody else was going to come with us. Um, and so Jackson Brown lets Linda Ronstadt record Rock Me on the Water before he does. Yeah. And even more famously, he lets Glenn Fry finish Take It Easy and put that yes. on the first Eagles album before he does. And people, you know, Graham Nash said to me, you know, you would bring your guitar on Saturday night and people would kind of be like, hey, this is what I'm working on. And you'd be sharing ideas. And even I think Jackson Brown was the one who said, that, you know, this was a period, probably the only period in which not only the musicians were hanging together, but the executives and the agents and the producers. And there was there wasn't this sense of hierarchy or barriers. It was that they were all kind of swimming, I guess, sometimes literally uh, in the same pool. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, sharing, (laughs) sharing ideas. Bill Press with journalist and author Ron Brownstein. If you'd like to hear the entire episode, visit BillPressPods.com. And that's all for the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Ben Jealous, Cheryl Cashin, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. For the America's Democrats podcast, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.